geothermal technologies off this. And I'm and we are very grateful for the funding and the support on this project. It's a very interesting project. Uh, you notice there's an asterisk here, the EGS CoLab team. So here's a, a more complete list of my co-authors. Um, you'll also notice on the bottom of these slides, there are a couple of different uh, places where you can find information on the EGS CoLab project. Uh, I'll, I'll go into this a little bit more detail later, but uh, there are addresses here. And when my slides are uploaded, if, if you'd like, uh, you'll have the ability to, to uh, take a look at those. Uh, we are from 10 national laboratories, eight universities, uh, the Sanford Underground Research Facility, and a couple of industrial partners. And our goal is to answer EGS questions. And by EGS, I mean enhanced geothermal systems. Uh, those are systems that, that you build when you find hot rock and you either don't have permeability or don't have fluid, so you're adding the missing ingredients. So our project is, is uh, to be a collaborative experiment and model comparison project. We're to compare and validate reservoir model predictions with the 10 meter scale field experiment data. And I see that Mark White is online and Mark is taking our, our validation of, of uh, codes and models very seriously. He's our, our lead for the modeling and simulation working group. Uh, we, have, we are to perform in-depth fracture characterization uh, to do well-performed and well-monitored experiments collecting high quality data using comprehensive instrumentation. And I'll, I'll get to that. Uh, we have a goal of elucidating the basic relationship between permeability enhancement and stress, seismicity, and other parameters. Uh, instru we're instructed to improve the tools for FORGE and EGS. And one of, our, our, one of the things we do is we have to face and address problems that will occur, and those occur both in the CoLab project and will occur on, on other projects as well. We envision our, our project as three major experiments. Experiment one, we looked at hydraulic fracturing, and we did that at, at 4,850 foot depth at the Sanford Underground Research Facility in Leeds, South Dakota. So on the right side, let me get a, a pen here. On the right side, you see uh, there's an open cut mine, um, and then there are several ways that you can get underground at, at SURF. Uh, at the 4,850 foot level, there are a number of physics experiments. We were able to work off of one of the drifts there uh, to, to try to investigate hydraulic fracturing there. Experiment two is we're going to be doing, or we are setting up to do on the 4,100 level, 4,100 feet deep, so a kilometer and a quarter, also at SURF uh, in a different strata, different fractures. Um, we hope to also attempt experiment three, and that will ha uh, happen concurrently with experiment two by using different strategies for, uh, for stimulation. And each of our experiments, we, it consists of multiple stimulations, characterizations of flow, tracer, and heat transfer, and pre and post test simulations have to be performed for each so that, that we can do model validation. The schematic for experiment one is shown here in the upper left corner. This brown line here is, it's called the West Access Drift. It's at 4,850 feet deep. Uh, we set up our experiment next to the former Kismet test. There's a test where uh, some folks, including LBL and, and Los Alamos, uh, were, were measuring the uh, stresses in, in these vertical wells and we set up next to that our we have an injection well which is green here a production well which is red and then the, the six yellow lines uh, indicate monitoring wells to characterize the the system we did numerous things uh, one of the things we did is we asked the modelers what data do you need to model this system and the answer that came back was, what data can you give us? And so they pretty much said everything you can give us. So we did optical and acoustic televiewer, full waveform seismic, electromagnetic, gamma, temperature, fluid conductivity, and the test block, so this region in here. Uh, we did P and S wave characterization using mobile and grouted sensors. Um, 
and extended hydrologic characterizations, electrical resistance tomography, both of the baseline system and, and later of flow tests, and also of uh, uh, fracture angle. That, that was a little, little bit slow for that. For the, the core, we looked at lithologies, fractures and veins, did X-ray CT, magnetic susceptibility, gamma density, P wave velocity, and I'm, I'm, all, I'm getting tired reading all these things that, that we did. Um, and in the, the system for monitoring our stimulations and flow, we had acoustic emissions, continuous active source seismic monitoring, micro earthquake, electrical resistance tomography. We had uh, fibers, uh, distributed temperature, uh, strain and acoustic. And we did direct 3D fracture displacement using the SimFIP tool. Uh, this is another depiction on the, the lower uh, lower left here, another depiction of our, our system, uh, injection well here, uh, production well, and our monitoring wells. And each one of these jewels you see on these lines indicates the location of either a measurement or a sensor for our test. And, you know, one of the questions that, that I always wonder about is which data are the most important data? And in looking back at experiment one, which is now complete, the, the most uh, the best data, the, the most useful data, were data to make decisions from. And so there were things that came in late, things that came in slow. Some of them I'm going to show you today, but uh, they, were, they were less valuable at the time. Um, they're, they're really good for understanding what happened, but they were not good for making decisions. Uh, our experiment two setup on the 4100 is shown in the lower right. Um, our access to the, the, the tunnel here is at the Yates station. Uh, we have a little alcove we call the battery alcove. We've drilled a few monitoring wells from the battery alcove. We mined out a little test region on the drift, and uh, we call that site B, and have some, some monitoring wells that are, are drilled in from the drift. They span a, a wider fan than our, our fan of monitoring wells in experiment one because we did have some problems with fractures hitting our monitoring wells and, and breaking them. We also have multiple production wells which, which uh, surround our injection well. The injection well shown in green here and the production wells are shown in red. And, and then this is either a production well or monitoring well and, and uh, it will declare itself as we do our first stimulation. One of our charges was to engage a large community of researchers and um, and we also took it upon ourselves to try to achieve adaptive control. We had a, during one of these sets of tests, we, we ran a 30 day 24 seven zoom meeting and we had people calling in from around the world to watch what was happening in our experiment. We had done some stimulations, we were doing some flow. And so what people would see is, is what's on the, the panel in, in front of you. You see a number of, of data streams that were coming in live. And so this is you know, essentially taking the blood pressure and temperature of the system uh, to observe what's going on. What, what are our flows? What are our pressures? Um, in addition to that, we had a, a system where we were locating uh, MEQs. And we were locating them typically within about 30 seconds of an event. Um, it was a little bit challenging because we are working in an active research facility underground. So there you can see in this, this picture here, there are train tracks. So there are trains running around in here. There's always work with jack leg drills, um, you know, all kinds of, of tools underground. And so our, our MEQ sensors were always, uh, they were always recording something. And so we had to do some, some machine learning, uh, write some machine learning algorithms to separate out all the different noise sources versus the the MEQs we were seeing. And so still within about 30 seconds, we knew where our, our MEQs were. And, and so that was very helpful for decision making, for decision making on the flow rates that we could use, um, pressures that, that we could use as well. Um, all of these data, um, by the way, were typically uploaded within 10 minutes or so, sometimes uh, more quickly than that, to a, a system that, that uh, NREL set up for us so, so all the people on the project could access the data as soon as possible after it was collected. So it, it wasn't, most of it was not on somebody's laptop somewhere waiting for an email that people could access the data immediately. 
Here's another cartoon of the experiment, one set up just to look at it in a little bit more detail. Uh, we drilled in the direction of the, the minimum principal stress. And so the, the disks you see here, these gray ellipses are ideal fractures that, that would happen in a, a perfectly uniform, perfectly uh, you know, isotropic system, um, which of course we know we don't have. And, and so, um, we, we drilled, uh, because of some work that, that folks have done, like Ahmad Gassimi and uh, Abbas and all, we looked at what would happen around a borehole that, that was drilled in and how would the fractures actually start forming. And we were convinced that we were not going to get fractures that would be perpendicular to our well. And so upon further simulation and further thinking, we decided that if we could cut some notches in this well, we would probably do a better job of, of inducing these perpendicular fractures. Now, the, the picture in the upper right here, um, it always takes me two or three looks to figure out what direction everything is. And I've looked at this before, so if you're a little bit confused, that um, that's okay. So what we're looking at is here's a borehole that goes into our rock. We have a packer that, that's put into the borehole. So here's one side of the packer. The other side of the packer is up here. And then we, we modeled putting a notch into the borehole uh, to, to determine or to, to guide the initiation of a fracture. Um, based on our simulations, uh, Jin Su at, at Sandia designed a, a borehole notching tool that we did use to, to notch the borehole. And, it's uh, difficult to say whether our, our fracture started there because of the acoustic televiewer uh, shows a, a dark notch, whether there's a fracture emanating from that location or not. So it's difficult to tell, um, but, but our modeling did show that we would be, be much more likely to generate the fractures we wanted with a, a tool like this. I wanted to show a couple of numbers here. I usually don't show numbers in my presentations. Uh, these are stimulations in experiment one from the 164 foot notch. We, we put five notches in total. We found three of them to be interesting. Uh, the 164 foot notch we thought was our most interesting notch. And so we did a number of stimulations from that, that location. Uh, the first one was a very small one. We were trying to create a, a 1.5 meter uh, radius ideal fracture. So, you know, we did the calculations based on ideal fractures. We would take that and, and go to five meters the next day, and the next day go all the way to the production well. And then following that, we had a couple of flow tests. One of the things I really want you to notice, well, first of all, the volumes that we use are, are relatively small, and the flow rates we use were also relatively small uh, relative to what you would see in a field test. Uh, I want you to look at these numbers here, the, the, the pressure. So the, the instantaneous shut-in pressures are around 3,600 PSI, 3,700. Propagation pressures, um, you know, they're, they're slightly above that, but they're all in the you know, sub-4,000 PSI range. Uh, the reason I want you to notice that is on the next slide, I'm going to talk about our flow tests. And in our flow tests, you're looking at a number of panels of data here, and this is, I don't know how many gigabytes of data. I'm going to walk through some of it a little bit slowly, so, so it's uh, not so overwhelming. Um, in the top panel here, the top two panels, actually, the blue line is our injection pressure. And you can see our injection pressure is, is always well over the 37, 3800 PSI that, that we did our fracturing. Um, and beyond our fracture propagation pressure, although we don't believe we were doing much in the way of, of fracture propagation based on our MEQs. The flow rate is shown over here. It's the green line, the green line here in the, the top two panels. Um, and the flow rate was typically around 400 milliliters per minute. And this was run for about a year. Uh, the uh, panel in the blue on the left side here is we're, we're injecting ambient temperature water. Everything else from the blue, all of the white is chilled water injection. So we're trying to mimic uh, what we would see in an enhanced geothermal system by injecting cold water into our system and observing what happened from there. So one of the, the things that we observed is every time we 
shut off our pump, even for 30 seconds, even if you know there was just a fault and a restart. Um, the injection pressure required to to achieve the same flow rate dropped by 200 psi, about 200 psi. You can see it in all of these red circles here. You know the pump would go off for some reason, restart, and even though it's flowing at the same rate and and it's it's a matter of seconds compared to how long the, the system had been been in at you know some pseudo steady state. Uh, the injection pressure declined significantly. And we have a couple of ideas why that might have happened. One is that um, there could have been biology in there. And when the, the pump shut down, the, the fracture closed and squeezed whatever was there. When we, the pump came back on, the biology, or, or actually that could be chemistry as well, if we have precipitates that are forming, um, they're not in the way. And, and so we have a, a higher permeability. Another explanation that's been given is a poroelastic explanation that um, while we flow in the system over time, so these longer duration flows, uh, the system tends to return to more of its normal um, normal situation where you know there's there's water that's being imbibed into the pores, uh, the 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 pore the rocks is you know I think of it like a sponge it, it tends to return to its its normal condition so the permeability de permeability decreases well, when the pump turns off while well, water is squeezed out of the system and it, it uh, provides us with a system with higher permeability there there seems in that argument seems to have some um, uh, I, it. it it's a little bit more difficult for me to, to understand that argument um, just because of the the lack of symmetry between the you know the month that the system's running and the 30 seconds that it's not uh, but I, um, it's not not something that we fully comprehend another thing i want you to notice from from these data are when we go from ambient temperature injection to chilled water injection unfortunately our pump went off again so we do have that 200 psi discrepancy that we get but the slope of the pressure change uh, was different when we were injecting the cold water versus the ambient temperature water. You can see in all these other times, like we're around this letter A, the pump goes off, it comes back on, and the slope is upwards. When we injected the cold water, the, the slope was downwards. And that's from contraction of the rock around the borehole as as the cold water uh, is injected. We see a couple of other instances where similar things happened. For example, um, the, our chillers went out at, at, at C here and at D. And, and you can see the chiller went out, the temperature went up, and the pressure required to maintain that flow rate went up as well. So it went up by a couple hundred PSI in both of these instances. Um, there's a question, did you include any additives in the injection fluid to limit bio or scale buildup? And we did include additives to limit the, the bio, um, but we did not for, for scale. Um, one of the things that was, was really interesting and, and almost mind boggling, we have a lot of access to our rock. And so we have a lot of data to look at. And so creating a, a model of our system a discrete fracture network model was was actually very tenable we, we the, what you're looking at here on the left side is our, our discrete fracture network model and in addition to that it has other things that we noticed it's, it's kind of a system model um, so we took the fractures from our boreholes and and we put those in our model uh, we took our MEQs, which are these orange dots here, and we, we included those in the model. We took other observations where we would see leakage or we would, you know, something else happen and include those in the model. And it, it gave us um, a, a way to approach our system that, uh, you know, we were lucky to have this access and lucky to, to be able to understand it in this way. But it, it does show the complexity of a system that we initially went into thinking we have a nice homogeneous piece of rock that we're going to be working in. Um, I am I'm convinced that that such a nice homogeneous piece of rock probably doesn't exist. Um, I want to show you a little bit about 
our DTS data. So this is distributed temperature sensing data. In each of these yellow wells, these monitoring wells, we have a distributed temperature sensing fiber that, that runs throughout. And um, so, you know, a number of things happened, but we thought that this was gonna be our, our way to detect uh, our temperature changes from injecting chilled water. And we, we kept looking for that, but, in essence, what we did see is we saw fractures that intersected our monitoring wells. And these fractures uh, were indicated largely by Joule Thompson effects. So where the water, where the well intersected the monitoring well, there would be a, a decrease of pressure. And because of, of uh, the Joule Thompson effect with water, there would be an increase of temperature with that decrease in pressure. So we were able to locate number a number of, of fractures which went through our system by the, these Joule Thompson effects and the the uh, intersection with our monitoring wells. So experiment one, uh, we did a, a number of major experiments there. We did multiple stimulations of three intervals. We established hydraulic connection between wells, and I'm going to talk to you I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Um, we also, you know, did some things we didn't want to do. Uh, for example, we, we stimulated a, um, you know, here, here was our, our 164 foot notch. This is the, the, uh, injection well here, the production well here, the drift is over here somewhere. Um, so we were, we thought we would be, you know, stimulating this direction because of a, a temperature gradient. We also uh, had some fractures and we stimulated some some natural fracture sets, which was, you know, in hindsight, it was a, a, a really good lesson, um, a lesson not to always trust our conceptual models. Um, and, and, and so it, it, it changed some of the ways we approached the problem. And, and um, you know, we looked at different places to inject. We looked at, you know, different ways to, to, to go about um, trying to cause water to flow through our system as we thought it ought to. We did a number of tracer tests using uh, several different kinds of tracers, biological tracers, um, uh, conservative, non-conservative, DNA, uh, C dots, a, a number of different kinds of tracers. And we did a year long cold water injection test with about 90% water recovery. What I'm showing here in the lower right is a video in our production well. We drained the production well, we started injecting water in our injection well. And, and this was kind of a, an interesting thing to me, particularly, is that we had water coming into the, the production well in jets. And so you can see these, these jets squirting the water in. In this case, in this location, it's, it's coming in along a natural fracture. This is also along a natural fracture here. Two feet in, however, uh, we had jets coming in along hydraulic fractures that we created. And interestingly, they they are pretty much exactly where we, we thought they would be. Um, uh, so that was a, a validation of, 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 of part of our process here. So all of our tests were done with this continuous geophysical monitoring and extensive analysis uh, aided by near real-time numerical modeling. This, this was key in understanding what was happening. Um, people would take a look at data, they would take a look at it, you know, as it came in, they would do, they would add it to their models, they would look at it, and, and, and they would be able to report out, typically in, you know, sometimes it was more than a day, sometimes less than a day, sometimes it was less than an hour, uh, to try to understand what's happening and, and make decisions to move forward. Experiment two, um, we are targeting shear stimulation, and we're going to be working on the 4100 level at SURF in amphibolite. The experiment one was in phyllite. We have a number of fracture sets that we've had to consider in the design. And, and we've, construct, we've done our drilling at the site. We are installing our equipment and monitoring wells right now. We've done some hydraulic characterization. None of these fracture sets are taking water. So they are going to, to be uh, a challenge in, in to what we can do in terms of the stimulation. So. Um, we're talking about different strategies to get water into those fractures to, to try to induce a shear stimulation. We've drilled two characterization holes, nine test and monitoring boreholes. We've done eight stress tests with the SimFIP tool on the 4100, 10 without. 
Uh, we are using stress indications from uh, the RESPEC group who are doing thermal uh, breakout testing on the, the 4100. They've used some of our boreholes to, to try to, to get an indication of stress. Uh, we've looked at numerous test bed designs and our, our test bed is nearly complete. Uh, what I'm showing the center panel here is we, we drilled a, a 150 foot well, or actually it's a 50 meter uh, well, vertical well from the battery alcove. So from here, we drilled downward. And uh, we found some things, of course, that we didn't expect. We found some rhyolite layers. Uh, there's a, a thin rhyolite layer at about 72 feet down. And then there was a thick rhyolite layer at uh, about 110 feet depth. We did the stress tests, as I mentioned, and looking at the uh, instantaneous shut-in pressures, giving us an indication of the minimum principal stress. Uh, we see that in this upper amphibolite, we have a stress gradient that, that uh, you know, it, it tends to look like it's, it's uh, lowering as you, or decreasing as you get lower. Uh, in the rhyolite, we have even less um, stress. And then in the lower amphibolite, it's an increased minimum principal stress. So based on this, we decided to try to do the entire test, uh, the experiment to above this lower rhyolite layer uh, to try to avoid that it, it could just be a fracture magnet essentially as we do a stimulation could draw the fracture so we're trying to do the entire test above that rhyolite layer um, this is just a, a better view of that um, so I, I told you i'd tell you where there is is project information and we have a wiki page there's the address for the wiki page when the slides are uploaded you'll be able to to uh, grab that or, or um you know if, if you can contact me i'd be happy to send you the address for that it's actually in my title block our data are mar migrating to the geothermal data repository i think all of our data currently are available on the data uh, geothermal data repository uh, you can see that this year we had over 3,000 downloads of our data and so I think that we're being successful in distributing the data. I know that Forge is being very successful in distributing their data as well and getting it out for the community. Uh, I've seen the numbers there. Uh, we have our data index in Google data sets so that it, it's easier to find. And we use uh, Google Scholar to, to index our, our papers, conference papers and, and journal papers uh, using the, the author name EGS Colab. And so you can find our, our papers there you can you can download them and take a look at things um i always i give a lot of um that information in in presentations and i thought this was an opportunity to talk about some other things that i thought were were really fun and interesting as well um so i did talk i made a list of, of things that i thought were cool and and the list was really easy to write and it just kept going but I talked about all these these things in gray up above the, sti the notch simulation and stimulation, uh, rapid location of micro seismic, uh, addressing noise, data quantity, uh, water squirting into the production well, our discrete uh, fracture network model. I'm also going to talk about predicting the direction of the fracture propagation. I'm going to talk about our, our DAS data, distributed acoustic, our ERT electrical resistance tomography, and micro seismic. CASM, continuous active source seismic and passive seismic uh, correlation, a distributed temperature and MEQ correlation, our, our SIMFIP, which I still wish I could remember what all those letters stood for. Um, it's a fantastic tool. And, and simulating heat transfer. Let me just get on to this. There's some really cool things here. Um, one of the things on the 4850 that, that we knew that we had is the temperature of our host rock was about 35 degrees. And the drift had been ventilated for decades. So the, the temperature of the rock at the drift was about 20 degrees. Um, Mark White did some simulations and, and based on measurements, we had the sets of measurements of, as well. He extended the, the, the temperature field and plotted out what the temperature field uh, should be for our system. Um, Peng Cheng Fu took this, this data and, and informed, informed um, based on this, he, he created a heterogeneous stress field and our injection point is this red dot and he did simulations looking at, at what direction the fracture should go 
based on the, uh, the stress gradient, which is dependent on the temperature gradient. So out here is our drift. Uh, we have a fracture and, and you can see in his simulation, he's got a fracture and it's moving towards the drift. And, you know, this is, is really cool. Um, when you look at the, the actual data, so we're looking at the MEQ data. This is, is Martin Schoenball's MEQ data. We did our, our stimulation and the red dot is the same in all three cases. We're looking from the top here. The drift is, is out to, the, uh, to the, the right. And so we did our, our stimulation. And from this location, this, these are MEQs from multiple stimulations, but this, the, uh, the MEQs from this particular stimulation, they went towards the drift just as, uh, as we would have predicted. So uh, that was one of our early validations of, of a, one of our conceptual and numerical models. Um, we were using multiple types of data to corroborate each other. Um, what we're showing here in this blue panel is we have some some distributed temperature sensing anomalies and so we start out our test and and there's nothing happening we just all the temperature is uniform um well it's it's not uniform but this is a changes in temperature there's no changes in temperature we start pumping and we see in in one of our wells we see a temperature signal and then we're like what, what could this possibly be you know the temperature of the water it's the low flow or how could it possibly be uh, providing a temperature signal and we keep doing it and there's this correlation that builds up and one of our researchers said well you know we we were doing simulations and we saw something like this in the simulations but we just didn't believe it so we kept trying to figure out what it was but we were unable to figure it out um, we went in the lab and did some tests and what we saw is that you know as water expands as it goes through a, um, from high pressure to low pressure very quickly uh, there's a joule thompson effect and so there's an increase in temperature that that can be sensed and so we were able to sense the location where fractures were intersecting some of our monitoring wells and we were able to use that to validate that our, our, our meqs our location of meqs because they were indicating that they were crossing the monitoring well as well so it was a, a unfortunate thing that happened that we were able to use and and uh, use to corroborate our data I want to talk about our distributed acoustic sensing data a little bit, and this is data that, that came in late in the process and um, it hasn't been shown that many times. Um, okay, I have a request for electrical conductivity data. I'll, I'll get to that in just a minute. Um, I'll get to the resistivity anyway, and maybe we can get to the conductivity from there. Okay, so what we're looking at here is five panels, and I showed you earlier on five uh, stimulations or flow tests. And so there's a panel for each one of those. In the bottom of each of these panels, we have our pressure in orange. And so that's red on the, uh, the right side here. Our injection rate in blue, which is red on the, the left side. So you can see the injection rate in this case was 200 mils per minute, which is not very high. Our pressure was you know, over 25 MPa. On the top half of these panels, we see the distance from the injection uh, to the MEQs that were located. So of course, over time, as you start, you expect the distance to increase. And, and you know, that, that makes some sense. You can see that in each of these. This is not a perfect correlation, which is actually kind of good because there are things that are still happening close to the well as you continue to do your, your stimulations. So in each of these cases, you can see we have a rollover pressure of about 27 MPa um, and that's where water starts, uh, really starts to move into the, our fractured system. Uh, it's fairly consistent throughout. Now I'm gonna show you a little bit more about this panel D, this flow test D, and, um, and, and some of the, the strain that we see. So in this, and I apologize for this, I, I, I tried to, to have people um, use similar systems for, for each uh, you know, description of the system. This black line here is our drift. These big gray lines are our monitoring wells. Uh, we have our injection well and our injection location here, and our production well is the other black line. Okay, what I'm gonna show is, is uh, as we start injecting, you'll see the, the pressure, which will be the orange, or it'll be the curve on the, uh, the orange curve on the, the right and the, the injection flow rate, which is the blue curve. And we're gonna see the strain uh, from the distributed acoustic sensing uh, seen at, at tens of meters away. 
Um, let's see, how do I do this? So we start out here, we're starting to inject water. We have a pressure 10 MPA, the pressure's increasing. And we, we're not, we're not seeing anything happen. Um, and, and that's okay because we, we're not to the point where we're opening the fracture yet. And now we're close to the point where we're opening the fracture. And you can start to see a little bit of reddening here, uh, indicating that we have some extension here. Now this, this, this borehole here is, um, let me stop that, is the borehole we call OT. And we did break the, the borehole OT and we broke it right here, unfortunately. Um, but uh, you, you'll see the strain in these other wells as the test goes on. Um, so now we've rolled over, we're flowing water into our system. We've probably flowed 20 liters at this point. Um, and you can see the, uh, the strain at, at all these different locations, tens of meters away. The green X's here are micro seismic events, which are occurring at the same time. So our micro seismic events are showing us things that are happening, you know, a couple of meters from, from the borehole. Uh, but we're, we're seeing strain, you know, 20, 30 meters away from the borehole. We're seeing compressive and extensive strains. Um, this, was, this was really quite amazing to me uh, that we could make these measurements and, and understand this, the, the strain in our system at these distances from injecting, you know, 20 to, to 50 liters of water. Um, let's see. Um, we've had a number of successes in modeling. If I were to, I showed you a list of cool things a little bit ago. Our successes in modeling is, a, is an equal long list of, uh, of things that, that we did. Um, one of the things that we did is we were always looking for temperature changes in these fractures. And we had our distributed temperature uh, system and we were looking at the plots and looking at the temperatures over time and wondering what's going on. And, and then we start to see you know, um, things like this, um, you know, little bulb forming and, and what's going on here, you know, is if we had a fracture, we'd think we'd have a sharp change in temperature, sort of like we're seeing up here, but we're seeing these bulbs form and, you know, what's going on here, we, you know, we're concerned trying to, to figure it out and, and, uh, uh, Zach Frone of GTO says, well, don't you have conductive heat losses in your borehole where you're injecting the, the fluid? And lo and behold, uh, when, when we threw that back in the model and checked that out, it was a spot on uh, understanding of what's going on in the system. We had a, a lot of, of conductive uh, heat loss into our, our, well, it was conductive through our system um, just, just from injecting the cold water down the borehole. And that's where we're seeing most of our our temperature uh, change there. I wanted to compare the, the uh, micro seismic and the electrical resistance tomography. So I, I've shown this picture of the micro seismic where this is a top view of our system. This is the injection borehole here, production borehole here. Um, here's our injection location, it's this red dot. And these are fracture planes that we've, we've identified from uh, you know, the, the MEQs. If you rotate this around, um, you, you will be able to see these fracture planes. Um, and we took this and, and we also did a, a injection of, of distilled water. It turned out that that distilled part really didn't matter that much. Uh, when we looked at the ERT signals from that, the ERT is, the, okay, let me take a step back. The MEQ tells us what's happening in the rock. So the rock is making noise and, and we're detecting that. So pieces of rock are hitting other pieces of rock and, and making noise. So we see what's happening there. The ERT is telling us what's happening basically in the fluid. And we oftentimes have to rely on the, the uh, MEQ in the field. It's, it's the best data we have typically. But what's interesting here is if you look at this big bulb where we have a, a large part of our flow and you compare it to where it is over here, we don't see a lot of MEQs in this region. So the, the point of this slide is, is we, we, and we all know this, it, it, there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence between what we're seeing in our MEQs and what we're seeing in, in where the flow will go. Um, th these are some results from the SimFIP uh, tool. And the SimFIP tool is a, a tool that you can lock in onto two sides of a fracture or fault and you can pressurize the, the fracture of the fault. 
And so we use this to do some stress measurements. We used it to do stimulation as well. Um, on the left side here, we have flow into the, the, the region in liters per minute. We have the pressure uh, in orange. And then we're looking at the SIMFIP tool uh, um, results uh, over for these same regions uh, for the pressure and, and flow here. So what we, we can see here, first of all, is that we're looking at the scale of microns, uh, which I, I think is amazing when you have a, a, a kind of a, a, a tool that goes on a packer um, that you're looking at something as, as fine as microns. As a matter of fact, we had this set on uh, two benches at, at LBL and uh, it, it was running and someone set a paper cup on one of the benches and the SIMFIP tool picked up an indication that there was a change just based on the paper cup that was set on the table. It was uh, very impressive. Um, but what we can see is that as, as we increase our pressure, we see uh, a strain in the vertical direction. So vertical means fracture opening. And then we see some, some shift. So we see some lateral strain. When the system was shut in, we see closure in the vertical direction. And then when we did a step down pressure test, uh, we see further strain and resulting in what, you know, 75, 100 microns of, of, of total residual strain after this, this uh, stress test was done. Um, we, we've used this continuous active seismic source monitoring uh, to, to try to tell us what's going on in going on in our system. And so this continuous active seismic source, what we have here is a monitoring well. On the bottom here, we have some sources that we're pinging the rock with, so uh, seismic sources. And in this top borehole, uh, this is the OT borehole that we ended up breaking, but um, we have sensors. And so we ping the rock and then we listen at our sensors and we try to determine the travel time and and then we can do some tomography based on that um let's see so our same system is depicted here on the right with uh the blue uh, dots being the the sensors the red dots being the sources and we're looking at the interval pressure as we pressurize uh doing a stimulation and the flow rate as, as we do the stimulation so we're as, as we increase the pressure, we don't see anything across this, this field, it, it, or the yellow field that you're looking at here. As the pressure comes up and we roll over, so we are it, putting water in our fracture at that point, we see changes in wave speeds over this field because of the, the injection of water. As we continue, the the change in, in wave speed is, is is actually pretty dramatic there's the 60 meter per second change in wave speed um so this is indicating you know the the flow in the fracture um and then as we continue we depressurize the system and we're left with a, a residual change uh indicating that, that there's been a permanent change in the system if we take a look at how this compares to our passive seismic. Well, there's a very nice correlation between the, the passive seismic and the active seismic um, in showing us that you know, the, the passive seismic shows us where there were events. The active seismic, though, shows us uh, kind of the magnitude of the changes, residual changes. So in this image here, we see the, the red dots are the, the uh, passive seismic just listening. We also can overlay our distributed temperature sensing and show where the fracture intersected the well OT. Uh, so it gives us a, another corroborating evidence stream. Um, tracer testing has, has been something we've, we've used to try to understand our system. And one of the, the things that's been kind of maddening, or I guess, you know, my conceptual models have been shattered um, is, you know, you, I think you have this giant rock system and you, you apply some stress to it and then it should stay relatively constant, but it, it didn't stay constant. The, the rock system kept changing over time. Um, Hui Wu at Livermore took our, our tracer test data and he approached it stochastically and he allowed uh, things to change in the aperture of the fracture um and he allowed different places for the fluid to drain out of the fractures you see this orange curve here you see a little black line in some of these cases that's an intersecting fracture 
and he allowed millions of these things to occur. So he, he applied a strategy where he had lots and lots of, of, uh, of cases. He evaluated millions and he, he tried to match those to the data that we collected. And interestingly, um, you know, of these millions of, of realizations, four of them that were the probably the best all indicate very similar similar uh, situations where we have leak off around the mostly the same part of the edge we have a fracture that's in the, or intersecting our main fra uh, fracture at about the same location so I, I thought this was was extremely interesting of all the things that you know you throw at this all the things that could happen and there's some consistency there and so it, it makes you think you know is, is this a a real um is this the way that that the, the rock system is behaving and it certainly indicates that it's something to, to strongly consider um one of the things that we did in the laboratory is look at fracture caging we were interested early on if we had a fracture that was approaching our drift would we be allowed to continue uh, we didn't know what would happen if the uh, water hit the drift would we be forced to stop the test so luke fresh went to the lab and did some experiments and peng cheng went to his computer and did some experiments um, on the the left side here we see numerical simulations of what we think would happen if you inject fluid um, in, in the center here and uh, you just watch a fracture propagate. So you can see that the fracture propagates outward just as you would expect. And in the lab, that's what Luke saw as well. You see the fracture propagate outward. If you put a, a zero pressure well or monitoring well or production well, well, what happens there? It drains the pressure off, of course. And so away from that, you know, things tend to behave as you would expect, um, but the pressure's drained there. So the fracture is, is caged at that location. And uh, Luke's experiments show the same thing. And continuing on, if you, you put a number of these producers or whatever wells, zero pressure wells there, you are able to actually cage the fracture so that, that it, it cannot keep uh, propagating. The approach to validation on the, the project, uh, we've done numerous tests. I mean, I've, I've showed uh, numerous model and, and uh, experiment comparisons. We, we have not set out to uh, for example, say this is the acceptable approach or the acceptable code. The, the modelers have been been uh, looking at how to model these things and trying to determine the best way to to model the the uh, data that we have to model the the questions in advance. And so the the validation has has been very organic along the the uh, course of the project. And so we have have a number of cases of interesting validations and interesting uh, papers that are, have come out of that. So I'm, I'm at about the end of my presentation here. Experiment one, we had many interesting stimulation experiments and observations. There's a lot of available data and metadata and we're open for collaboration. Experiment two is on deck. Uh, we expect more interesting stimulation tests, more interesting simulations. Again, we're open for collaboration. And what I mean by that is contact one of the, the authors of, of this presentation. And, and um, you saw on, I think it's slide two or three, there are about 100 people that, you know, find somebody that, that you'd like to work with. And if you're interested, you get the data, uh, look at the data, play with it, see, see, what, you, uh, see what you think of it. Um, uh, we're really interested in having other people take a look at it and 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 analyze it from their their own perspectives. And uh, that's all I have this morning. Tim, thank you. I mean, it, it's really evident that this has been an astounding success. Um, and and we need to congratulate your whole team for generating such wonderful data. And. One of the consequences of generating wonderful data is you may get a few questions about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and, let's uh, We'll just go through this, the chat and, and I'm pretty sure you've been monitoring it too from the sounds of it, but um, uh, Ali Danishi has an explanation for why it takes lower pressure to start injection after, after uh, the hiatus and pumping. Um, and, and if you're okay, maybe we'll just let Ali um, go off mute and, and uh, offer his explanation. Please, I would love to hear that. Actually, 
there were multiple features of your data that support what I'm going to uh, explain here. And that is when you create a hydraulic fracture, the fluid pressure inside the fracture is not constant. The fluid is gradually moving along the fracture. And so, and fluid pressure is good. I, actually at the tip of the fracture, the pressure is almost nearly zero. So as you shut in the, the uh, while you are shutting in, the pressure inside the fracture is gradually equalizing. So as the pressure inside the fracture is equalizing, the total force it stays relatively constant, but the pressure distribution changes because you have more pressure along the fracture, lower pressure at the wellbore to give you the same amount of force. So when you start re-injecting, you're looking at a different pressure distribution inside the fracture, and uh, which, which means lower pressure at the wellbore, higher pressure along the fracture. And that's why you are seeing what you're seeing. And incidentally, that raises another question, and that's the interpretation of what you call ISIP or shutting pressure. Even after you stop injecting, the fluid pressure is still trying to equalize inside the fracture. And that's what causes the pressure to gradually decrease as it stabilizes inside the fracture. So what you exactly consider as minimum principal stress needs a little bit more in-depth analysis than just looking at what is traditionally called the shutting pressure. That's just my observation there. Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I'm going to think about that. I've been thinking things along those lines, and I, I just haven't been able to pull that all, all together. Thank you very much. Actually, there were other evidences of that happening also. And that was the uh, continuous events that you were detecting even after you stopped pumping. And uh, the reason those events are happening is because even after you stop pumping, the fracture is still growing as the pressure equalizes inside the fracture. As it equalizes inside the fracture, it activates some of the natural fractures along the way, shear displacements and so on, which is why you're observing uh, micro seismic events even after you stop pumping. The fracture is still growing. You are not pumping, but the fracture is growing. Mm. Great, thank, stop you. thank you. A lot to think about there. And here's some more to think about. Can, can you talk about the conductivity data a, a little bit for motion? So um, I, I just want to clarify the uh, the conductivity data that you're interested in. Can can you come off mute for a second? So sorry. Uh, thank you, John, for a great presentation. There was a slide where you were uh, comparing all the different events that were happening on multiple graphs. I think it was mm -hmm. so in the middle or beginning of your talk, maybe more beginning of your talk actually. And then at the bottom, you had the electroconductivity data as one graph, but you didn't describe those. So I was curious if you could, yeah, write that one. I was wondering if you have drawn any um, parallels between what you're observing and what Ali was describing just a few minutes ago um, on these electrical conductivity data. No, I assume uh, just fresh water yeah. injection, right? These are just fresh water injection into the background of some salinity. You're not adding any additives or anything to improve the electrical conductivity, but you're just basically looking at ERT data in this case, correct? In this, uh, is this the slide that you're, you're yes. thinking of? So yes. yeah, this is just source water uh, electrical conductivity and produced water electrical conductivity. So we have oh. the two, two different streams and uh, we have not done a, a very good analysis of, of those two data streams. I mean, the source water is, is what we get. There's really no, no I see. choice there. Um, but we could talk more about that, um, and, and I could I could dig up that. Or it's not hard to dig up. I could get that data for you. Uh, we would really want to take a look at the metadata in trying to understand that, uh, just to make sure that that we that we believe what we're looking at. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so so let, let's take a look at that separately. That'd be great. I, along the same line, I was curious. Um, would you all be interested in collaboration on another set of data from another field study that is kind of looking at similar type of results? In, in fact, I mean, with the data analysis, I'm curious if the scientists that are collaborating with you would be interested in looking at another set of field data. Um, well, we could talk about that offline as well. Great. We typically are Thank very interested in looking at what's going on elsewhere. Yeah. Well, Thank what, you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, please contact me. Sure. 
And, and if I may make an observation here, if you look at this chart that you have right here, you can see that at a constant injection rate, your pressure is gradually increasing. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is the, is the uneven distribution of pressure inside the fracture. In other words, the pressure inside the fracture is not keeping up with the injection rate. The fluid is staying further and further uh, behind, which means that at the well bore, it has to be higher, has to have a higher value in order to cause fracture uh, propagation uh, at, uh, at the same injection rate. So this data is also supporting that. And if I, if I may uh, just make an observation here, and that is my exper uh, experience with these types of uh, data has been before we start modeling something, we first need to establish a very good reasonable understanding of what are the events taking place and then try to model those events in the simulations as opposed to seeing the, the, the uh, data and try to uh, find out what is the cause of a true simulation. Simulation to explain a physical event as opposed to predicting a physical event and that's just an observation from me. Okay, we, we've approached simulation from a number of perspectives, both uh, we used simulation heavily in, in the design of the tests. Uh, we've used uh, simulation to, to uh, guide us in, in the changes that we make in, in the uh, operating parameters. And we've used simulation to try to understand what happened as well. And so we, we're approaching we, uh, simulation from, from a num number of different perspectives. Mark, would you say that's correct? Tim, that's spot on. Yeah, just the way you explained it. So we, we did do uh, lots of simulations before we even uh, did a stimulation uh, just to uh, understand uh, what we expected. And they, I think Tim showed those through uh, Pin Chang's work. We knew we had a thermal stress gradient and we were worried about uh, having, the, having the hydraulic fracture that we we're going to create uh, migrate to the drift. Uh, and then, um, you know, afterwards, uh, we did use simulation to try and understand uh, basically what Tim is showing here. And so there, there are still some unanswered questions. Uh, 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 one of them, Ali, you just uh, referred to is you gave a nice explanation for uh, what you thought was going on here with these pressure drops with uh, stop and pumping. Uh, and the other one that's kind of still uh, open is basically this injection pressure rise over time. So uh, both of those have been tackled by different simulation uh, approaches and attempts. And I don't think we have a, a quite a clear explanation. So, yep, you're you're exactly right, Tim. Thank you. So, so maybe if, if I can just move on, we got there's a couple more questions that have been posted. And Gong Han, uh, Gong, you know, is always searching the truth, and he says that the recent HFTS two findings also confirm the difference between um, 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 microseismic activity and DAS. And Gong wants to know if you have a suggestion for which one is real. Well, I, I'm going to have to answer that with a single word, and that's no. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, um, we can get into a, a more in-depth conversation on that, and we probably should uh, with uh, some of the folks that, that are doing this work in, in a little bit more detail. I, I personally can't answer that question. It's, I think it's a really good question, though. Um, and then, then we, we have a, a question from uh, Eddie Siebritz and, and Ed is congratulating you on a really nice talk and, and fantastic data set. And I, I know we all agree with that. So you said in experiment one, you mentioned the treatments were about 3,800 PSI, but long-term water injections exceeded 4,000 PSI. And he doesn't remember the rates and the viscosities, but he's, 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 he's speculating. And why the higher injection pressure in the water injection tests? Is it due to fluid finding longer flow paths, natural frac paths, than during the short injection stimulation test? And, and, and he, he brings up scale buildup and things like this. So I think this is a follow-on to some of the, the previous discussion. I, I agree. I think this is a follow-on. And, and I think that uh, he, he's probably right in, in all of the suggestions. Um, you know, the, we have the advantage in the, the collab side of, of having um, really good access to the rock and, and really uh, excellent data. But 
I, th I think the one thing you learn is that there's never enough access to the rock and never enough data to answer the questions that we want to answer. Um, and so, I mean, these are, you know, the, based on the, the discussion that we had a little bit earlier and, and, and this question, I think that there are, are lots of, uh, of, of unanswered questions here that, that we need to keep thinking about and keep thinking about not, not just that they're unanswered, but how to answer them, how to make the measurements, how to do the simulations to to extract that exact information out? So, um, yeah, I, I I I like the the, the priorities of the, the things you list there. I think they're very important. So we're going to let Dan Moose have, have the last question here of, of the day, and and Dan's question is: Did you measure pressure in the monitoring wells that were receiving fluid? Uh, that could help uh, validate the expectation of a pressure gradient along the fracture. We did not. We were unable to do that. Um, we didn't know a priori where the, the fractures were gonna, going to break into our monitoring wells. Um, it's a, that's a, a really good question, but it's a, a real difficult thing to implement. And we might be able to implement it in experiment two, where we have a, a free floating monitoring well, where we can put packers in. Uh, we have, a, in, my, in experiment two, we'll have four uh, grouted monitoring wells, but we will have one that's free floating as well. And so uh, we we will possibly be able to to make that kind of measurement. Uh, but it's a difficult measurement to make because you just don't know where the fracture is going to intersect your monitoring well and and how to design around that. I, I have a suggestion here for you to see if it is possible to implement this, and that is to shut in the section of the monitor well where you think there will be frack interactions, apply some, inject fluid into it so that it is holding some pressure before you start the experiment, and then measure the variations of pressure as you fracture the, uh, the main well that you're fracturing. Because what you may observe is what we observe in oil and gas industry all the time. And that is that the pressure changes are caused by two different sets of events. One is, what we call fracture shadowing, which is compression of the formation due to, to fracturing, compresses the fluid in the monitor well and raises its pressure very small amount. And second one is fracture inter interaction, which is the fracture actually intersecting the segment of the monitor well where you are uh, recording the pressure. And by measuring the volume of the fluid uh, the magnitude of the pressure, you can calculate the volume of fluid which has migrated into it and actually get a measure of the conductivity of the link that caused that pressure increase. Uh, if you could do that, I think that may be an interesting addition to your experiments. Well, thank you. Yeah, in, in experiment two, we will have a, a chance to, to make a different uh, kind of measurement uh, just because we have four well, production or monitoring wells, however we, we uh, would like to declare them um, and, and to make those those different kind of measurements. So uh, we didn't have that option in experiment one. So, um, you know, we, we, we can make some different different measurements in, in the upcoming experiment. I'm, I'm afraid in, in the interest of time, I'm, I'm gonna have to um, postpone um, additional questions. Um, I, I know Madi has one. Uh, but maybe just drop Tim a note directly. And I, I think Gong's comment here says it, says it perfectly. This is great work and it's a fantastic presentation, Tim, and, and we really appreciate you sharing it. I mean, I think all of us have learned a lot and, and uh, it's, uh, uh, it, as you say, you know, the more data you have, the more questions you get. And so that's, that's real value. This has been a tremendous su success story and, and you and your team all need to be congratulated on. Um, as well as the DOE for um, making this possible. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to give the presentation. I appreciate all of your time. I appreciate your thinking and, and your questions. Um, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Um, so, uh, excuse me, John. Could you share? Um, Tim's contact information would be possible. Yeah, um, who, who am I? <laughs> who am Sorry, I? this is Mosin. I apologize. Oh. I, yeah. 
I was asking a question and he asked me to contact him. Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, I, um, I will definitely do that. Um, okay. I'm, just, I'm here at the Bureau of Economic Geology. If, if you could maybe. Um, can you put your 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 email on chat just to make sure? I'm, and I must have it, but uh, it would I help. I can us. certainly do that. Yes. It's coming your way. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. This, this was a very great talk. I really appreciate you organizing it. Well, I, I didn't have anything to do with it, right? I mean, <laughs> uh, I, I have to agree. It's just a fantastic set of information. Yes, it was great. So you should have my uh, information in the chat. I really appreciate you sharing. Um, uh, I, I definitely will. Information. Thank you so much. Take care of yourself. Bye-bye. You. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.